Spotify. Welcome to Deep Tech 315. Our first topic is Apple finding some common ground with the EU, uh, getting good in terms of the EU regulations, specifically related to iOS and the ability to use third-party payment stores within Apple's ecosystem. So right now, if you have your iPhone and you go to point of sale, you double click, the only thing that can come up is Apple Pay, or if you have a payment mechanism within the Apple ecosystem, it is Apple Pay, but they're gonna allow third-party wallets to plug into that. Caught my attention because it's rare that Apple is reactive when it comes to regulation. Typically, they're proactive. They typically step in front of things. Think about what happened related to the changes in some of the App Store take rates a few years ago. That was being proactive around that. They uh, also were proactive at making some changes related to USB-C uh, going from Lightning and also, to a small extent, the, the repairability of phones. Uh, that's on the react the, the proactive side reactive just mentioned what happened with europe they were also reactive in china related to a certain apps that get banned and so they kind of respond to chinese leadership on that front but overall it's pretty rare that apple is reactive and uh, that piece of it caught my attention we'll jump into the impact of apple but i just wanted to get your initial take when you saw the headlines my first take was this is Something that kind of stems into, uh, you know, a long battle or long, let's say, uh, discussion. I'm sure they've been having with the EU about all things related to the App Store. There's a lot going on there. For and sure. There's also probably a, a lot going on behind the scenes. And, and to your point about uh, being proactive, I wonder if they sort of knew or sensed something was coming and they were trying to get ahead of it. I think that this all kind of plays into that idea of, Slowly but surely, I think the App Store and Apple's ecosystem will get a little bit more open. It has been getting a little bit more open over right. the last year, particularly in the EU. I think this is just the latest sign of that. I bet there's probably still more to come. So on that being more open, of course, that they have agreed to allow some form of steering in Europe and they came up with some changes. And then the EU or this year said, not enough, we got to make further changes. And so that's still kind of in a process of, of working itself out. And so this kind of presented itself. But when we think about that collectively, kind of the opening up of this, my bottom line question is like, what does it mean for Apple's business ultimately? In my sense, at least with this payment mechanism, yes, they're going to allow third party payments, but... I bet 90% plus of people won't even go through the hassle of setting up a third-party wallet. Because keep in mind, even if it comes in the in another inside another app, you still have to set up that wallet. This isn't as easy as making a change in your settings, which a lot of people won't do that. And so I feel like this is a lot of noise for nothing. I don't think behavior is really going to change, at least specific to this this piece of it. There's the symbolism of it, and then there's the actual effect of it. And, and I think that they are two different things. And to your point, I think you're 100% right. The actual effect to Apple's business in all of this opening up of its ecosystem, I think is going to be pretty negligible on the margin. But I do think symbolically it matters because there are people within the Apple ecosystem, or at least uh, you know uh, around the Apple ecosystem, some of them are developers, who are saying like there, there should be a freer and more open reality to Apple's ecosystem. And I think we're starting to see a little bit of that. You're never going to make everybody happy, but I do think that the symbolism component of it maybe matters in some ways a little more than the actual effect in the business because it probably won't affect consumer behavior that much. People are lazy. I'm lazy. I don't want to go set up a bunch of different wallets. I'll probably keep using the Apple product, but at least knowing I have that option is a freeing yeah. thing. And I think it's fair in the marketplace. Makes sense. Uh, we'll jump to our second topic, which was another surprise headline that uh, Tesla is going to be delaying their uh, RoboTaxi event from August 8th to sometime in October. I don't know if it's official. This is like Bloomberg reporting, but I want to take three steps back and give a little bit of the, the background related to this August 8th event. It came out of a fire drill that was going on when Reuters put out a story saying that Apple is abandoning uh, the the lower, the $25,000, I think it was a $25,000 uh, vehicle that they were selling those pens or they are selling the RoboTaxi, I forget which one it was. But uh, the, immediately the after, two, I think. the Model 2, uh, yep. Musk uh, tweets out within like hours that we're doing an event on August 8th. And it felt like 
pretty reactionary. We should have seen this. I should have seen this one coming that it was going to get delayed. But it, it's worth noting that when Apple, Elon's done this before, he's felt behind on autonomy or uh, some hardware and has, uh, I think he had RoboTaxi Day back in the day, a uh, different rope, uh, that was the AI event. But he has kind of scrambled these events together, kept the events on schedule. But then, of course, when the actual products come to get delivered, they're always late. And so here we are uh, from, we're, we're shifting from August, September. Um, and I thought is like, does this really change anything? The bar is still really high for what he's talking about doing. And whether it comes out in August or October, people are still going to wonder when the products are actually going to be available in 25 or 26, if ever. I think, first of all, we can't be sure that anything has been delayed until Elon blesses it and says it's been delayed right. to your point That's... about the Reuters report. Right. I mean, they yeah, said maybe not. Model yeah, 2 he was, could. was not happening. And, and he said that this is a lie. I think that was one of the firestorm kind of tweets that, that followed that. Um, I just ch uh, checked Twitter before we started recording. Elon has said nothing yet as of uh, two o'clock. Yeah, he could push this Thursday. up and so, just say, just to you spite. You never know. It, he, he has tweeted since the report came out. So the fact that he hasn't said anything very quickly says there's probably a delay if we're going to really play mm -hmm. the game theory of it. And maybe by the time uh, this video comes out, it's all but confirmed. But I think the, the point of the matter is what you just said. Uh, what Tesla does, the products they build are really hard. I try to be a Tesla rationalist, which is hard because there's so much religion on both sides of the More issue. More than any other company more than any company. And I think that if you really try to be objective about Tesla, they solve incredible real world, hard physical problems, better than probably any company. And doing that often takes longer than they think and longer than investors hope. And I think the, the reality of this delay, if it is a delay for the event, is it probably shouldn't be a surprise. My expectation was even if they had the event in August, whatever timeline they put out in August right. probably would have been delayed anyway. And so mm -hmm. it's almost like we're jumping forward to the conclusion. I'm sure it's the delayed. robo taxi is going to come out and it's going to be incredible. It's going to be awesome. It'll be the best robo taxi in the market. I have very little doubt about that. I also think it's going to take a lot longer than people think. And it'll probably even take a little longer to really impact the model because Tesla's a really big business too. Mm -hmm. That's that's fair. And I think there's not much more that I can add beyond that. I do believe that they're going to get there. I think you just said that. I think that they're going to crack this. I think it is a path to higher profitability. I think autonomy is going to improve humanity in part because it's safer, in part because you pick up some more time So, uh, and should lower the cost of transportation as well. But undoubtedly, uh, now we shift our calendar to October and our attention to the final topic, which is an internal topic at Deepwater related to how these chatbots are progressing, how we're using them. And most people, first of all, most people don't use them. The people that do use them, a lot of times use them to help craft a letter, an email, maybe generate an image, uh, it's, uh, summarize some text. It's pretty straightforward, but uh, there's an opportunity to use these models to help predict the future. And so we did a, a quick sample of 15 questions. So we asked the four primary models, that of course being ChatGPT, Gemini, Claude, and Grok, uh, 15 questions about events that are going to happen in 2024, ranging from sports to politics to geopolitical and uh, to finance. And uh, I'm going to just highlight a few of the questions and then I want to get your take, Doug, just on like what's going on behind the scenes here. Cause I know that you've been intensely studying this dynamic around these generative models, but some of the questions we asked were who is going to be, or is Joe Biden going to be the democratic uh, candidate for president? Uh, that, uh, do you want to guess, I don't know if you saw the results. Do you want to guess what they said? I did see the results, so I, okay. I, I won't. Uh, okay. Uh, Gemini wouldn't respond. Them. Anything political, Gemini just keeps his mouth shut. And then we had GPT and Claude saying maybe Biden. And then uh, we had uh, Grok saying it would not be Biden. And then the question about who is going to be the next president, kind of, uh, this one was a big surprise to me uh, because we can look at the odds that the humans' odds that are making, but two of the four said that Biden would be the president. Now, if you look at the human odds here, Trump now is heavily favored by about a 3x uh, margin right now. That's the betting lines. And so this is an example of the models going a very different direction than what the, uh, the humans have. A couple other predictions that uh, caught my attention. One was that the, 
that China would invade Taiwan by the end of the year. That was Grok and Gemini, I believe, said that. Couldn't believe it when I saw it, but it's just a prediction. And separately, those same two models predicted that essentially there'd be a correction in the Magnificent Seven by year end, like a 35% correction in some of them. And so those are some pretty uh, bold statements, I think, or bold predictions from from the the, the, the models. And I'm just curious, like, what's going on behind the scenes? Is this just natural about becoming more human-like? You're naturally going to take shots like this on net if you're asked? Uh, if, you, if you back all the way up and you just think about what are these models built to do, they're built to answer questions, prompts, queries from users in ways that they think make sense based on their training data. So at a base level, based like on their training data, you said based on their training data, right. And system instructions and some, some other things that we could get into, but based on their training data, let's say to make it simple. Um, what I think is interesting when we think about, let's say the political piece of it, whether Biden will be president uh, or the, the, na the nominee or not on the democratic side, who will win the presidential uh, race. I, this is one of the things about Grok that I think is interesting is obviously it's training data is, quite a bit different, I think, than Gemini right. or Claude's, if you look at the responses. Gemini and Claude, if I remember Claude, Sonnet 3.5, I think their training data window goes up to like mid this uh, Q1 or something like that. I think it's current. Oh, this I see year. what you're saying. And I think yeah, Gemini they... was, or Gemini didn't answer, uh, GPT, I think was maybe late last year or something like that. So first of all, they may not even be aware that there's this right. question about- What about the uh, RAP? What's it called? The RAP or the RAV that- where you can kind of oh, rag. add in the rag, yeah. Yeah, you have that... to custom, custom train that. And that, that gets into this whole idea of making these models a predictive force because I will tell you, I think that, so we ran a, a fairly basic experiment here. What's really interesting is that you can run even more complex experiments. You could layer on other things to, I think, make predictions even better. And what you can do is you can take data from more current, systems, you can take proprietary data, you can take whatever you want and feed it into the models to give it a little bit more of a sense of the current environment. So for example, uh, if we wanted to retest this, we could give the models data about current predictions, current oh, gotcha. betting lines in the election, right? Or current betting lines for the Democratic president. I don't want to give it that. I want it to think outside of being a human. I don't want well, it to go off of poll data then... or... Yeah, you, that's the thing that I think is, is difficult to balance in these prediction exercises. And so I've been uh, getting very in the weeds with using these models to make predictions, stock predictions, as we've talked about before. But I've also been using them more recently to make very detailed earnings predictions for individual companies. And what you can do is without trying to bias the model, because there's always a potential for that, depending on the kinds of data and instructions you give it. But if you balance the data right, and you balance the instruction set right, and you give it some prompts that use something like chain of thought reasoning is one pretty powerful tool where you kind of give it a, a list of instructions. And this is basically how a human would process a question like this. If you were an economist, let's say, and you wanted to predict whether the Fed might cut interest rates, you might look at unemployment, you might look at inflation, you know, you might look at things like that, GDP growth, um, and you might make some certain assessments of, of that as a human economist. You can tell the model, hey, this is how a human would think about it. The model will actually think of it like a human and process it and then give you an answer based on that chain of reasoning. And so that's what I think is really cool with these models is they are these dynamic tools. You can give them a simple request. Hey, just make a prediction for me. It'll answer the query because mm -hmm. that's what it's trained to do. It did, yeah. But you can, I was surprised but, at how quickly it answered it too. Exactly. And you can take it to another level though and give it that data. You can give it that chain of thought reasoning and I think you can get even better predictions. And that's what I'm seeing so far in some of my testing on these earnings predictions. 10 second answer. If you start feeding it more data on top of it, are you biasing the model to a prediction that you might want? Depends on the data entirely and it depends on the prompt. You have to be Got careful it. in the prompt because sometimes they will take it very literally. If you yep. say, you know, historically it's been X, they might just say, okay, well, historically it's been okay. X. I'm going to say no. X. Okay. So that's not really that useful. That's the chief prompt officer here, <laughs> Doug Clinton. On behalf of our chief prompt officer and Gene and Deep Tech 315, bye for now.